We've all experienced this tragedy before. You're about to eat a strawberry, but upon closer inspection you realize it's covered in mold. You sadly toss the strawberry into the trash can. While this seems mundane, you're actually taking part in a key interaction on the battlefield of life. Have you ever taken a moment to wonder why fruits rot? Why carcasses decay and meat spoil? For some of you, it might just seem like a fact of life. For others, you might say, I don't need to wonder, I know. You'll say, foods rot because microorganisms like yeast, bacteria, and mold get into food, and they break it down, releasing enzymes and chemicals, and it's that which causes food to spoil. I can't argue with that. It's true. Microorganisms are the main cause of food spoilage. However, I want you to think a little bit harder. Why is it that microorganisms produce these compounds in the first place? And answering this question leads me to one of my all-time favorite papers by the great evolutionary ecologist Daniel Jansen, titled Why Fruits Rot, Seeds Mold, and Meats Spoil. To understand why foods rot, we have to see life from the perspective of a microorganism. Let's go back to the strawberry you are about to eat. There are about three things a microbe has to worry about in its life. On top of the strawberry, our microbe first needs to worry about how to use it. It needs to convert the strawberry into more of itself. In other words, the microbe uses its strawberry as food. The second thing our microbe has to worry about is competition from other microbes that might disperse to the strawberry, also seeing it as a meal. Third, and most importantly for us right now, the microbe needs to worry about you. Well, not just you per se, but any large organism that might see the strawberry as a tasty snack. You see, the life history of most microbes doesn't include your digestive tract. At best, if you swallow a microbe, it'll pass through you, but it still loses the strawberry it was trying to eat. You're stealing its meal. However, most microorganisms that would be found on a strawberry will meet their untimely doom while passing through your body. So microorganisms needed a solution to avoid getting devoured by us and other large vertebrates. And what they came up with isn't so different from what I used to do to avoid sharing my apples with my brother. This is a Granny Smith apple. It is also my favorite kind of apple. And growing up, if my parents asked me to share half of it with my brother, I would do this. And lucky me, I would have the apple all to myself. This isn't very different from what microbes do to us. For example, as bacteria break down food, acids and other waste products are released. These chemical changes to foods can make them very unpalatable to a number of species, and in some cases, even harmful or lethal. The key insight Dr. Jensen had was to think about the competing interests of you and the microbe, who both desire a shared resource, a strawberry. Traditionally, if you learn about competition in ecosystems, you might think about lions competing with hyenas over wildebeest, or different species of birds competing over seeds. You might even think about microbes competing against other microbes. What you're less likely to think about are humans and yeast interlocked in mortal combat. But that is exactly what's happening. There's a constant war going on between vertebrates like us and microbial life. It's a race, and to the victor go the spoils. Dr. Jansen thinks about it like this. You see two strawberries on a plate. One is perfectly fresh, and the other is moldy. You're very hungry, so you need to choose one to eat. If you take the fresh one and don't touch the moldy one, the microbe has won the battle. More broadly, about one-third of all food produced in the world for human consumption is lost due to spoilage. In countries such as India, microbes conquer up to 50% of all food produced for humans. It seems to me that microbes might be winning the war. So why do foods rot? It's because of us. It's all part of microbes' evolutionary response to dangerous competitors like us, who will mercilessly eat them whole. There's some more interesting evolutionary ideas to unpack here. Let's think about a piece of bread with some mold growing on it. Eating the bread could have some health consequences, especially if the mold is a mycotoxin, which is potentially lethal if ingested. Even if it's not harmful per se, there's still a good chance it will taste disgusting. In other cases, eating the mold is completely fine. There won't be any health consequences, and it will taste relatively normal. It will just seem kind of scary. I think we all instinctively know this. We all eat cheeses that have mold. We eat fungi, which are mushrooms. We put yeast in bread. Some people even eat this crazy Icelandic 
rotten fish substance. However, encountering a moldy fruit out in the wild, eating some mystery fungus growing in my refrigerator? Yikes. Leave me out. My skin absolutely crawls looking at some of these pictures of mold. Probably because it's deeply ingrained in my DNA to fear potentially harmful bacteria, mold, and yeast. I don't even care if they're dangerous or not, they just look disgusting to me. And maybe that's the point. Doing a little research for this video, I came across an article that addresses what to do if you found you've accidentally eaten some mold. This part of the article is about what to do if you're experiencing some symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea. They write, don't get too freaked out. You're not likely to get seriously ill or die from eating a little mold. Generally, the worst part is just the thought that you ate mold. Triggering disgust is likely the basic strategy that many yeasts, molds, and bacteria use to avoid getting eaten. Mold, in a sense, might be warning a potential vertebrate, hey, stay away, I'm dangerous. The interesting part is that even harmless mold will trigger disgust in us. This seems very similar to me to what evolutionary biologists call Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is when a harmless species adapts traits to resemble a foul-tasting, poisonous, or otherwise harmful species. The idea is that predators will evolve to avoid the nasty-tasting or dangerous prey, so if the harmless species can pass as an imposter, those predators may avoid the harmless species as well. For example, this butterfly is perfectly tasty, but it has evolved to look very similar to this nasty-tasting one. Similarly, this harmless fly has disguised itself to look like a fear-inducing wasp. It seems to me that mold might be doing something very similar. Harmless yet scary to look at mold might be impersonating scary ones, duping us into not eating them, tricking us to thinking that they're the truly dangerous kind. A quick side note that this is speculation rather than heavily supported theory, but I just find it too fascinating to not bring up. While well, microbes often do an excellent job in dissuading us from eating them, their strategies aren't successful in dissuading everyone. Species like vultures and hyenas have developed advanced gut technology against harmful microbes that colonize the bodies of deceased animals. Always in nature, there are arms races going on between different organisms. In this case, it's an arms race between the digestive tract of vertebrates and the compounds that bacteria produce. For now, species like vultures seem to have the upper hand. In the future, only time will tell. So I've talked about this whole idea why food rots with a lot of confidence, probably a little bit too much. While Dr. Jansen's hypothesis is very reasonable and compelling, it's very hard to test. The extent to which animals in the wild actually avoid things like rotting fruits is really hard to measure. In addition, even if animals do avoid them, it's hard to prove causation. It's possible that microorganisms produce compounds that cause foods to rot for reasons that has nothing to do with wanting to scare off vertebrates. For example, some suggest that microbes produce these compounds in competition against other microbial life. If that's the case, then scaring off vertebrates is simply a byproduct of that process. However, there is some indirect evidence in support of Jansen's hypothesis. For example, fungi that consume grains release compounds that are highly toxic to vertebrates like us, but don't seem to affect other fungi or bacteria. A recent mathematical model also finds the idea is theoretically sound. Therefore, Jansen's hypothesis seems pretty parsimonious to me. Overall, I just find this paper wonderful to read. I suggest reading it yourself. It's dripping with entertaining anecdotes from natural history, relevant events in human history, and deep ecological and evolutionary insights. It opened my eyes to what might be a widespread dynamic to life that I had never thought about before. All of these wonderful ideas aside, my favorite part of this paper actually comes at the very end, the acknowledgments. Usually, the acknowledgments are filled with boring thank yous to funding, maybe a few shout outs to colleagues who helped them with the paper. But here, Dr. Jansen writes, This study was inspired by paying 95 cents for a rotten avocado. To me, it's a wonderful example of how taking in the world around us and pausing to think can allow us to come up with exciting and perspective changing ideas. So that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, please think about subscribing to the channel. I'm planning more videos like this where I highlight some of the most exciting papers and ideas in all ecology and evolutionary biology.